management of nutrition and aphids in Alfalfa. My name is Ayman Mustafa. I'm an uh, area agent and regional specialist with the University of Arizona Public Extension. This is some work that we have been done over the years on these two topics uh, uh, in alfalfa. Uh, we know that we have this advantage here in alfalfa in terms of the production, although we have about 1.5 of the whole of the bitted area in the country we are closing the value to about you know, 13% of uh, the whole production and our yeah, in terms of the price because of the quality is a little bit uh, higher than most of the country and almost 2.5 fold of the production per acre uh, when we compare it nationally. And that's because of many reasons. We know we have these you know, non-dormant varieties, the availability of water and the high input and so on. All of that comes to a price, of course, when we are dealing with mostly like the nutrition and pest management. So we have like, as I said, all of these advantages that can come to us in terms of cycle cutting, the varieties that we have, and also some of the management that we can do all the time, especially when it comes to nutrition and the life uh, span of the stand. From this like uh, perspective, we would like to first touch base on the importance of nutrition and how we can like manage them. We know that mostly the most important fertilizers for alfalfa here in the area is phosphorus. And we are doing some work on that for the last few years, uh, uh, coupling with the potassium uh, uh, as well. So <clears throat> some of the objectives that we put for this work is first is to determine the yield response and some of the yield parameter response to different level of this fertilization and how we can also uh, detect this fertilization in the soil and in the plantation as well. So we, we conducted some experiments, some of them was uh, conducted in like small plots at MAC and the other would be with like some more controlled in like, like about three foot cubes that uh, almost represented to very few plants together to get more precise response for these treatments. Uh, we know like the, the, the soil at MAC is a little bit like sandy clay loam and we have uh, a low level of like uh, potassium here is a little bit over 6 uh, ppm with the Alson test. This is the source of uh, fertilization that we use for like the phosphorus, we use mainly MAP. And for the uh, potassium, we have the uh, 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 potassium chloride. And this is the rate that we're using. This is the rate as a formula here. And this is the rate as the uh, uh, each fertilizer that we are using for the phosphorus and for potassium, and that's what we use most of the time. So we have 0, 100, 125 down for phosphorus, 0, 100, 300 for uh, potassium. And this is mostly like, you know, the, uh, the design of this experiment that we have at MAC. It's about 400 square foot uh, at plot area, and we have this combination of this uh, treatment plus the uncontrolled, uh, sorry, the untreated control, and that's having this nine bright, I'm sorry, nine treatment replicated four times. And what we did was uh, fertilizing early in uh, November in 2017, and then we have eight cuts in 2018, 6, 2019, and we have like the yield adjusted at 12% of moisture, and we did soil and fish sampling for uh, uh, the phosphorus and potassium level and moisture. For this trial that we have at Maricoba Act Center. The other one, what we call like the tube trial, and this is a tube that we are using there. It's like a cylinder tube, it's about uh, almost like a foot uh, or less in terms of the diameter, and about, I'm sorry, half foot and about three and a half foot for the, uh, uh, for the height. And it follows the soil, and we have the plant uh, seeded there from the beginning. What we did is there was a little bit. You know, tedious because this is very small area and we were trying to get the rates per acre applied to this very small area. So we did some calculation and we have like our uh, fertilizer ready through so the same kind of source of fertilization that we use. And first we, we test some of the seeds that we have for, you know, germination it was really quite good after 48 hours. And we did our uh, uh, treatments back in October uh, 2018. And this is here about a week 
after uh, planting, and you can see the seedling are just coming out, and here about 12 weeks after uh, the yield that we are getting there. The, the, the soil that in this tube was a little bit on the sandy side compared to the uh, MAC one, the any difference here, but we are all, all also in a low range of the potassium, I'm sorry, the phosphorus when it comes to uh, uh, the soil test or the ultimate test. First, this is some of the results that we got out of the 2018 trial at MAC, and you can see here for the, the, the phosphorus fertilization, this is a back of phosphorus only here. It, it's, it has been good in all the cuts after January. Like you have here, like when you compare the 100 and the 125 pound, they are good giving, you know, uh, higher yield compared to the untreated all cuts, except like one different here in January and washed by uh, another different here in uh, I think June, but so there is no difference between the hundred bounds per acre and 125. So the higher rate and lower rate of potassium are equal in terms of giving higher yields than the outcome. 2019, almost the same scenario here when we have the two rates non significant from each other in terms of the yield. So it, it confirmed the result that we have back from 2018. In terms of like the separate effect of each of these fertilizers on, uh, uh, on the yield, again, this is the same for like the phosphorus. You have the percentage difference between the untreated and both treatment of the fertilizer. And in both years, the two rates are not significantly different from each other, but they are from the untreated. Same thing happened with the potassium. We have, you know, the middle rate here, which is 100, and we have like the 300, they are not significantly different. Although numerically, even we have lower response in terms of the yield increase when it comes to the higher rate. Uh, when it comes to combined effect of both the phosphorus and potassium on the yield for both years, like the, the, the blue one here, the blue line here is 2018, and the red one here is 2019, and you can see. The difference in terms of increasing the yield compared to the untreated is going, you know, almost all cuts that we have, and it ranges from as low like as almost 2.5 percent increase in the yield uh, uh, here in one of the treatment to the maximum increase in the yield, which is like ranging between like about 14 percent uh, reaching here, and that's was the middle rate. Of all of these fertilizers. So this is again like just a summary of the result of what we have before. So just to sum this up in terms of like number, the combination of the, the, the phosphorus at 125 and potassium at 100 down can give about two, uh, two pound increase in terms of the yield in total. And phosphorus, um, or the combination of phosphorus and potassium over potassium alone can give about 0.7 ton increase in the yield, while the combination of two fertilizers over the potassium alone can give about one one quarter ton overall. This is more of like what we can get in terms of the bottom line. This is the increase in terms of tonnage. And if you can like multiply this tonnage by what you can get per ton, that will give you the money that you can get in terms of uh, increasing this yield. And you can compare that to the cost of this fertilization. And from there, you can say, okay, whether well, this is like an economic benefit or not. And of course, it could be different from, you know, one year or even one month to the other based on the price of pay. In terms of the, uh, what happened in this like more controlled uh, uh, tube trial that we have in 2019, we have like similar scenario here. If you, it's a little bit complicated graph here, but the bottom line here, if you go at like the rate of 125 of uh, phosphorus fertilizer and the 100 of the potassium, you can see that it give us the uh, more yield compared to the others. And that's significantly higher than uh, the rest of them. And it's about 42% increase compared to the non-green. So if you do nothing, 
and you add no fertilizer, you are no way that you are uh, um, in your the bottom line is getting hurt quite badly in terms of decreasing yield here. Again, in terms of the increase in the yields, similar to the plot trial that we have at MAC, we have the two rates of, that of, of phosphorus. Yeah, they are higher than the untreated, but they are not significant from each other. Here. Same with uh, 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 the potassium fertilization, similar trend here as we have in the two. It goes a little bit higher because here we have like more precise calculation in terms of uh, the application of the fertilizers. It's, it's very controlled in very small area, and we can get as much information from it as we can compared to like just uh, cutting the hay out of a uh, small plot. Again, just to summarize that in terms of the bottom line, here you can see like the uh, uh, the combination of the two fertilizers decreased about 5.5 uh, uh, tons uh, of the hay when we have the two rates of the 125 and 100 down there. Uh, the it's a little bit higher than what we have in uh, uh, the plot from the slide that Mac. And again, it's because of the reasons that I just mentioned about how precise we can get the yield there. Similar trend here in terms of the in fact, of post fertilizer over phosphorus alone, we have almost two uh, ton increase. And for the combination over the potassium, again, we have almost five ton increase. In 2020, we were like trying to find out or find more of these yields and land parameters that we can measure in terms of uh, like the, the stand itself. How many shoots we can get per square foot or like uh, per plant and how uh, they can be there. And you can see here, this is the untreated at the beginning of the trial. And this is the one that has the uh, medium rate of phosphorus and potassium. And you can see like close to the end, the comparison even visually is quite apparent here. In terms of like the actual result itself, again, it's a little bit of busy graph here, but it's mainly here we have different parameter for each of these color of graphs. So we have here the yields on the top of the blue color, and then we have the shoots per square foot, and we have the shoots per plant, the heights of the plant, and on the bottom here, we have the mass uh, uh, per shoot. And as you can see, like most of these parameters at the 100 pound of potassium and 125 of phosphorus are significant compared to everything else, except maybe like one parameter here, which is the shot. So even like different parameter of yield here, a different parameter of the response of this fertilization, especially at this medium range of fertilization, is quite significant compared to untreated and even high. And it shows in terms of the phosphorus test that we have. This is here like the alpha test for the soil, phosphorus uh, in the soil, and this is here for the uh, plant tissue. And you can see what we see in other crops, especially like small grain, when you have like uh, sometimes early and mid season, and here it's like March and June, which is like the green and this uh, yellow color, they are higher compared to the end of the season or when you are comparing them to September, which means like the plant is depleting some of these fertilization from the soil. When it comes to the tissue itself it started you know, very low here in March, and then it will increase in the tissue in June and September, meaning that the plant is getting this fertilization from, uh, from the soil. And this important term of where and how we can do this testing to figure out uh, how much and what the uh, phosphorus and where it, uh, where it comes from and goes away. Again, this is like for the tube and giving us almost like a, a similar trend here of higher phosphorus early on the season and then lower with the gray color bars here later on. And then in terms of the, uh, the tissue itself, it's like lower early on and then higher later in the season. So phosphorus here in terms of like conclusion out of this uh, trial that we get, we know like phosphorus is quite significant term it comes to increasing the yield and other parameters of alfalfa here in our desert. 
potassium can do uh, can do some effect. It's a little bit slightly, but the combination of two can make some kind of synergism here, and it shows in terms of the increase uh, <coughs> increased yield uh, in both of them. The balance of P and K here is quite important. I know some of us might go with like the higher rate, especially with phosphorus, but it doesn't show in the results here and even some other trials that we did with our grower didn't show that they are doing much, much good. The, the medium rate, the 100 and 125 in terms of potassium and phosphorus is the one that's making sense and making some of this um, increase in the yield. Especially with the increase of the cost of suppliers, like now going like crazy with the price. So we need to be you know, meaningful when you apply this fertilization and know how to apply them and when. And we are hopefully making some additional research, especially now we have a soil health specialist joining us. So hopefully we will work a little bit to refine some of these results going on the economic uh, 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 analysis of it and see how much it will be you know, beneficial or not comparing to the price of hay. The other um, topic that I would like to talk about is one of the uh, um, tests that is quite important and causing a lot of problems, especially during the last season or two, and was early on also problematic, which is like alfalfa aphids. We have four of them, like two almost similar to each other, blue alfalfa aphid and P aphid, they are both like greenish in color, the only difference is these black dots on the antenna of P aphid that's lacking in the blue alfalfa aphid. And we have cow P aphid, like darker in color, spotted alfalfa aphid, which is like most of the time we cannot find it. But this year we can find some of these, and this is not a good sign because most of the resistance of aphids in our varieties is based on research on these aphids. We are looking closely to what's the meaning of the appearance of some of these spot alfalfa aphids in some of the fields. What we did over the year is that we tried to, you know, get some uh, work on the threshold for uh, alfalfa aphid, and this is here the result that we have for many years that we did this, uh, you know, relationship between aphid, uh, number of aphid per stem, and the yields as stem per acre. And you can see we have like different reaction over the years. The thing is, if you look here at the X uh, axis here, you will find like there is some difference and some variation in terms of the of, in terms of the aphid per stem. Most of the time we are talking about maybe like 50 aphid per stem when it comes to blue alfalfa aphid or like 100 when it comes to be alfalfa aphid. But if you look at some of these, we can get some response even very lower than that like 40 or 35 in some years, even at some uh, low as 10 or 15. Why is that happening? It's happening because of the composition of this aphid, which is dominant here. Most of the time, the negative interaction, like what happened in 2014 and almost in 2017, was associated with uh, increasing of the blue alfalfa aphid. So you need to know what's in your treatment when you are like getting some of these aphids, all of them are green. We need to figure out, even in sub of them, how many are blue alfalfa aphid and how many are P aphid, because that's maybe like the difference between doing something or doing nothing. Another tool that's in our like, uh, like toolbox here is some of these infection of uh, some of the entomobacogenic fungus. To, uh, uh, to aphid here. We found some of these aphid as, er as early as like 2014. Some of these picture actually, I took them from samples that come, came from oil back maybe like 2015, I think. Yeah, and we still like visiting the same area and we can find many of these infestations still there because most of these infestation of these like uh, fungus here, like Isaria and Zoptera, are like spores that can stain the soil for like forever, literally. And then when they find like a good condition, especially like moisture, they can initiate and they can reinfect these uh, this insect again. We have a grad student who just finished a couple of months ago. Her work was mostly about uh, you know how we can find different commercial formula of this uh, fungus and how they can impact aphids. 
and she did some good work in the lab about uh, this work here. She did mostly work on two commercial formula of the Algeria and Bovaria pathiana. Both of them are quite known in uh, uh, terms of the fungus. And she did like two of this kind of treatment to mimic what we can see in the field. One is what we call the direct spray, when she has this, you know, cups with some agar here, and we have aphid, and then just to spray them directly with a micro sprayer here, something similar to also what happened in the field. Or what we call the indirect application, when she has this little, you know, weld here, and what, what happened is that she sprayed filter paper in this well, and then she put a still little piece of alfalfa stem, and then add to the add the aphid to them, or introduce the aphid to them. Again, something that we can find also uh, uh, in terms of how these insects expose in the field. The result was, you know, I say it's not surprising, but what we have here in this left two graphs here, this is mostly the direct treatment with Isaria on the top and Bulgaria Badiana at the bottom. On the right here, we have the indirect treatment again with Isaria on the top and Bulgaria to the bottom. And you can see like the direct uh, treatment resulted in at least some uh, close to 55% mortality of this aphid for the Isaria. And when it comes to Bulgaria, it was about 40%. The indirect one is lower, about here 40% for the Isaria and even lower here, about 20% for Bulgaria. The thing is, we, we, we tested one of these from Mula, or actually both of them, in the fields early on before this work to find out whether they are working. And our result was here. This is one of the years here in 2017. And the bars here are mostly like the aphids that we found, the two alfalfa aphids and the uh, P aphid. And the green line here is, is the yield. And you can see like, we have here lower population, higher yield, higher population, lower yield, except this peak. So what's going on here? What's going on here is one is the Bulgaria Basiana formula in this column here. It didn't work because we still have population of aphid and we have lower, lower yield here, not, not significant from the untreated share. But the other formula of entomobasogenic fungus that we used here for the Bulgaria Pathiana, I'm sorry, for Isaria, is we still have population of aphid, but when we test these aphid, it are mostly infected with this fungus and it showed in the yield here. We have higher yield even as high as the best of the chemicals that we use. So that's that's a good signal here, a good you know information that this formula is working against uh, aphid that we have. And we have the same result here in 2018 study. Again, higher population of the aphid, we have lower yield, this is the untreated one, and then here, when we have uh, like some of these uh, formula that's working, we have higher yield. And for the formula of the Bulgaria, we have higher yield compared to the untreated. It is not as significant as the higher yield, but it's comparable to some of the intermediate uh, chemicals that we use, and significant comparing to the untreated. So we have like a little bit of mix of this uh, result. And I can contribute that to like mainly like two things. One is the level of humidity in the environment, especially under the canopy or what you put like the micro environment of the plant. If you have this humidity, you, you might like get more initiation of the formula that you are uh, testing there. The other thing, I think we, what we did in 20, 2017, it was an area that had previous natural infection with the Isaria. And that's why we have this double effect. While like in 2018, we changed the field, a new one that has no history of natural infection. So that might be the thing. But it will tell us that even like natural infection and the application of this formula, at least from this, you know, very primitive result, they are not competing. This is one of the things that we were worrying about the competition between natural infection and the application of whatever formula that we 